Hey there, rhetoricians. This is Josh for Com 231. We are here at day 13. We've made it to the end of week three. Uh, next week is it. After next week, we're finished. It happened so fast. Uh, but honestly, I've been having a blast. I hope you've at least not been hating things. Uh, today, we're going to talk about audiences. Uh, remember that if you didn't submit your extended response number two yesterday, I did extend the deadline to the end of the day today. Uh, you'll be watching this on Thursday, August 13th. So it is due tonight at 11.59 p.m. But remember, today we also have a discussion post. So uh, just make sure that you're allocating your time properly so that you can get everything done. Um, but I, I'm sure that you took note of that yesterday. So... I'm just repeating myself unnecessarily because you're all on top of your stuff. Uh, so here's an overview of the different things we're going to talk about today. Just like I said yesterday, I'm going to try and thematically organize these presentations for the remaining days just so that they're easier for you to follow along with in your notes and to sort of organize things. So we'll start with talking about how rhetoric can be adapted, adapted to audiences and then We'll talk about, and this is going to be the, the main chunk of our presentation, how audiences can be molded towards different rhetorical aims. Specifically, we'll talk about four different types of persona. It's going to be different from yesterday's notion of persona, so uh, keep that in mind, but I'll, I'll be really explicit about how it's different. Third, and the today really is going to be pretty heavy in discussing mechanics and technicalities of upcoming assignments because like I said next week is it so I'm gonna take some time to really parse out everything that's gonna be due coming up uh, so we'll take some time to talk about the essay the only essay that we have for the class uh, the artifact analysis essay I'll explain what you're going to do for today's discussion post and then finally, I'll tell you what you should be doing over the weekend to start getting ready for Monday, the beginning of our last week. Here are the key terms you'll want to make sure you have down somewhere. There are actually a couple more that are highlighted that I added in. Uh, so just if you see something highlighted, get it down. But these are going to be the, the really big hitters as far as the the core concepts that we're talking about today but just because it's not on here if it's if it's highlighted definitely get it down so section one adapting to audiences as a rhetor if you know you're going out there to persuade you're gonna want to keep the notion of audience in mind right you want to know who it is that you're talking to so here's the textbook definition here audience can mean any person who hears reads or sees a symbolic action the group targeted by a message, even if it is not present, or the group capable of acting in response to the message. So it, it's going to be those people who a rhetor is aiming to persuade, right? That's not that crazy, but we're really breaking down all of the components of the art of persuasion, and this is an essential component. So uh, even though it seems super mundane and obvious, you're going to want that down somewhere. How are we defining audience? Whoops. I need to turn my phone on silent, sorry. Uh, we've talked about identification, but identification is a key element of uh, appealing to audiences. Remember what we talked about yesterday with the notion of the rhetor's persona, right? You're going to present yourself a certain way so that your audience can, uh, can engage with you. You might, we specifically talked about notions of identity, but... Uh, you put on a certain image, a certain identity, so that your audience members can identify with you. Remember, we made the distinction between the, the identity that you put on versus identification or the to identify as a kind of action that happens. Uh, so we already have this definition down from our discussion of Burke. But one other really interesting idea that Burke gives us that I think is super fascinating I, it's not going to be on the test or anything, but uh, if you're interested at all in rhetoric, it's, it's absolutely an interesting concept, is the notion of consubstantiality. So, I just triggered Siri for some reason, sorry. My phone is just giving me all sorts of trouble. Uh, consubstantiality, which Burke takes from the kind of religious practices that we see, specifically something like uh, the communion in Catholicism, right, where th they would eat 
what they see as the flesh of Christ in uh, a, the form of a cracker. And in that moment, they feel as if they are, or, or their belief system says that they are fully actually eating the flesh of Christ in that, uh, in that act. Or, you know, certain, I'm pretty sure that's the, the main denomination, but it's been a long time since I've, uh, you know, acclimated myself to that kind of thing. But consubstantiality gets us this idea that you feel as if you are one substance with something. Uh, so it's not just in religious practices. It's also something you could see in some in ideas of like a political party, right? If you identify so much that you feel as if you are a part of all this action that's happening, uh, you feel this sense of consubstantiality. Substantiality and con, those two together meaning like one substance, right? Two distinct things momentarily becoming part of a whole. Of course, that necessitates that they're separate. Remember that whole metaphor of like separate nervous systems. One of the key elements additionally to appealing to audiences, and again, this was, remember why Plato kind of hated rhetoric was because it didn't just rely on logos, on logic. You also needed stuff like ethos and you needed to appeal to your audience in different ways. Another key element of appealing to your audience is going to be pathos, the use of emotion. So pathos appeals lead audience members to particular emotional states of mind. This is a key idea. It's a familiar word because you've probably heard it before in other classes. Uh, but also we read the word when we went over some of Aristotle's excerpt on the rhetoric. Uh, you could also see the root of pathos in uh, pathetic. If you feel sympathy or empathy, that, that is that same root. It's the kind of sharing of emotion, right? Another key concept of thinking through the role of emotion in audiences that the textbook talks about is the notion of public emotions, which is a kind of collective or shared uh, uh, experience of emotion that's in inherent to any community. But, you know, you could think of something like the 9-11 the memorial or when you hold a candlelight vigil to to show as a community your support for someone's loss. Those are all forms of an expression of public emotion. And as a rhetor, those are all things you can appeal to when you're trying to make a persuasive case. The, the most obvious example that uh, people often use for pathos is something like the, the Humane Society's advertisements where you see a starving kitten and then a starving dog and you're told for the cup of one or the price of one cup of coffee, you could help this cat. Maybe you do, maybe you don't do it. But either way, they're making an appeal to emotion in that instance. The textbook also breaks down different uh, other facets of how you can appeal to audiences using an appeal to their values, their beliefs, their attitudes. These aren't super critical for what we're talking about. So uh, you can absolutely use them in your analysis. You can really use any of the keywords from the textbook, even if we didn't talk about them in your artifact analysis essay. So I'll, I'll, I'm putting stuff like this in here so that you have it for reference, but I'm not gonna specifically use it in any of the example analyses that we talk through. Mostly because I think they're, they're fairly common sense. They're not necessarily particular to rhetoric. And then one other element that they bring up when they're talking about uh, crafting something for an audience so that it's more persuasive is notions of agency, right? So audiences can have different levels of engagement with a performance. So think of the difference between an audience in, uh, you know, the recording of something like SNL, where they're encouraged to participate with clapping and laughter and, you know, shouts of, of joy, versus an audience who's listening to uh, a, a, an orchestra, right? Where you're expected to be really quiet. If you have to sneeze, hold it in. Don't let anyone know that you're about to make a bunch of noise. Those are two different levels of engagement. They have different levels of agency in the creation of the performance. Uh, you could also think of the difference between watching pre-programmed television or watching a live television show like like American Idol. I don't think they have that anymore. And honestly, I'm too out of touch with pop culture because I don't have cable to know whether or not there are any more like live text in your vote type shows, but that, that's the only one I can think of. Or the 
textbook starts chapter six with the example of uh, Texas State Senator Wendy Davis when she does a filibuster and she has all of these constituents send in experiences and narratives that she can tell during her filibuster. The audience absolutely has a, a huge amount of agency in that instance because they're helping construct the narrative. So audiences can have different levels of agency, and that's absolutely something you can you can identify and analyze when you're looking at one of your artifacts. If your artifacts call for some sort of you know audience engagement, and that in some way impacts the persuasive nature of the artifact. Okay, so now we're transitioning to looking at different ways that you can mold a rhetoric or rhetorical object so that it's made specifically for certain audiences. In other words, you're choosing your audience and in choosing your audience, that itself is a kind of rhetorical choice. That sounds super abstract maybe, but as we go through each of these, you'll get hopefully a clearer idea of what we mean by that. So we're looking at four different types of persona. What The reason we're doing this is because for some reason <laughs> over the past I guess 50 years or so, rhetorical critics in their journals, like in, in our academic journals where we're publishing articles, have taken up this concept of persona and we've just kept saying like, here's the first one and then someone else said, here's a second one we could look at. Someone said, here's a third, here's a fourth. So there's no real justification for why they're in the order that they are necessarily, but uh, it's they're still important concepts. And for the sake of sticking to the tradition of the field and the way that different academic scholars who are you know, in the study of rhetoric, who are rhetoricians, the way they talk about this kind of stuff, I, I want to keep a, a certain level of fidelity to that. So that's why we're going to keep these titled the way they are. But don't don't let it bog you down too much. The reason being, the first persona is super straightforward. That's the one we talked about yesterday with the idea of a rhetor, right? When someone goes up on the stage to perform a persuasive piece, that's their persona. That's what we're going to call the first persona. So that's the author implied by the discourse. That's the traditional that's the traditional idea. You already have that in your notes. That's nothing crazy. Uh, but there was a transition that happened in the study of rhetoric. So uh, people wanted to be able to make a case for including more uh, critical analyses of artifacts where they could make moral arguments about something as unjust as need in need of, you know, democratic reconsideration. And these notions of second, third, and fourth persona are going to be different ways that rhetorical critics try to allow the field to have a, a theoretical vocabulary to talk about this kind of thing. Well, why? So it became common in rhetorical studies. What we now call neo-Aristotelianism was a tradition that they claimed they were following Aristotle's form of critical, not critical, but Aristotle's form of rhetorical analysis. Uh, where they would look at public discourse without judgment and they would just say, you know, here are the rhetorical appeals happening, here's what the rhetor is doing, and boom. What they were aiming for, again, this is a broad strokes characterization of a, a period of time in rhetorical studies, was a kind of neutrality or objectivity. But more often than not, it was it was baked into the kind of traditionalist American uh, perspective, like worldview, and uh, you know, it it wasn't necessarily following the same kind of virtue ethics or moral philosophy that even Aristotle would argue for. So just because uh, they were claiming to aim for the kind of Aristotelian or Platonic notions of objectivity or neutrality, doesn't mean that they actually were. There were a lot of economic and political implications in the way they tried to just neutralize certain kinds of conversations. And so for that reason, a lot of you know, the next generation of rhetorical scholars were going to say, no, we want to be able to talk about things like imperialism or things like uh, dominant ideologies that harm other people that are perpetuated by people in power, including professors who refuse to talk about things like race or class or anything like that. So that's going to be why there's this push for a new kind of vocabulary. And specifically, considering how, remember, the notion of constitutive rhetoric, considering how different kinds of persuasive artifacts call for a different kind of audience to to inhabit with the space 
to identify with the artifact, uh, that's going to be a really great way to be able to talk through these, these critical concepts. So the first we're going to look at is the second persona. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, it was put forward by a uh, rhetorician Edwin Black in 1970, where he essentially asked, well, what if we just try to consider what kind of audience is being invited or encouraged to listen to a certain kind of persuasive speech, right? Again, we're not just thinking about speeches. It can be anything, but for simplicity's sake, we're, we're just going to say speech. Uh, so, so he really explored that question. Who's being called to, to come and listen to this? Who's being asked to come and gather in the auditorium to hear this kind of speech? Uh, that's going to be a critical concept. Uh, and these are sort of in a poor order. Sorry, I'll go back to the ideology slide. So here, here's our definition for second persona. The second persona is the you or we to whom the rhetor speaks, the implied audience for whom a rhetor constructs symbolic actions. This is absolutely a, a, a massive overlap with the idea of constitutive rhetoric that we talked about. Remember the painting La Meninas, the subject of the painting, while you know the little girl is in the center, truly, uh, as we read with the Foucault analysis of the piece, the subject is a notion of you that's constructed, where you, from the perspective of the painting, are asked to inhabit the space of a king and queen that you can see in the back mirror. The same way that when we looked at the Uncle Sam painting, you know, he points in the iconic image and says, I want you for the U.S. military. Who is the you? Well, the you is uh, probably a male, able-bodied American citizen in a certain period of time to go fight in a certain war. And so this notion of the second persona, this is just going to be a theoretical concept that helps us talk about that notion of you, that notion of we. I think there's a mailman coming, so I'm sorry if you can hear my dog freaking out in the background. Uh, so the reason that we're doing this, the reason Edwin Black was so interested in this was because he wanted to be able to do a kind of ideological criticism. The way we're going to define ideology uh or the way I, I like to think of it is a little bit different from the way the textbook thinks about it. So the textbook, this was from chapter one. They define ideology as the ideas, values, beliefs, perceptions, and understandings that are known to members of a society and that guide their behavior. I, I think that works. And I think a lot of scholars might totally, you know, utilize an, a, an approach like that. Uh, but it's a bit too relative for me because then you can just say, well, anything is an ideology. And if you look at the history of philosophy, of critical theory, of, uh, well, right, of those two areas of thought, the notion of ideology is used in a, in a different way, in a more critical way, as in like used to question notions of power. So here's the definition that I, I think gets at a, a, a nicer way of framing it. Uh, so we'll define it as, a system of ideas that become unmoving in a worldview. So think of something like a, a dogmatic belief that you held that masks some element of social antagonism. So this is going to be a lot like the notion of uh, what we talked about with Burke, right? So if there's some sort of antagonism just means like there's some sort of social issue. So as a society, we can either identify with it and say, we're responsible for this, we're going to change. Burt calls that mortification. Or we can seek a scapegoat, right? Where we can push responsibility and say, that's not my problem, you take care of that, right? Scapegoating is a fundamental element of ideology. And once you've made that connection, it should be pretty easy to see that, you know, if a certain frame of thought, a certain worldview says, you know, we're not responsible for this thing, it's those people over there, that, that's when things start to get a little bit problematic, especially if that belief is unmoving, if you can't question it. If you try to, you know, engage in a democratic dialogue with a person about that worldview and they refuse to question the, their assumptions or their beliefs, that uh, is, in my mind, nicely uh, taken up in the metaphor of coagulation. So think of a, a dialectical thought, right? The free, free flowing of ideas, the questioning of assumptions as like blood cells flowing through the, the, your veins, right? When something happen, happens, right? There's a traumatic rupture, 
think of that like an antagonism, right? Something that needs to be addressed. Your blood uh, coagulates, right? It, it becomes a kind of gel. And that's the same kind of thing that can happen when we stop questioning assumptions, right? If you get a blood clot that becomes an issue, it blocks the flow of, of blood in your in your veins, right? Just like if you have a system of ideas that becomes too too unwavering that you know you're not willing to question your assumptions about it that can be a serious threat uh so that's just a silly little metaphor a, a couple examples this is uh an outdated like skateboarding brand uh they might be trying to appeal to a kind of edgy or transgressive ethos right where you would wear that and say like of course there's probably a bit of irony here regarding misogyny, but there nevertheless is a kind of, you know, anti-female misogynistic aggression here. Uh, but they're trying to get a certain kind of probably youthful, angsty teen who skateboards to see this as a part of their identity. Like, yeah, this bucks the system. There's something about this. The the image here, I'm, I'm all for that. But remember, Edwin Black's notion of the second performer excuse me, persona, Alaska allows us to ask, who is it that's being called to identify with this object? What is the ideology that could be at play here? Uh, and absolutely, we can look at notions of power here as far as, you know, masculine aggression. Or there's this uh, picture of Barack Obama where he's painted over like, uh, the Joker from The Dark Knight, and then there's the word socialism down there. Obviously, the audience being called into... I, I keep wanting to use this word, so I'm just going to tell you what it means. Interpolation comes from critical theory. It just means an audience is called into being. So, like, someone is being interpolated in this artifact who is, you know, critical of ideas of, of socialism or who thinks that Barack Obama is maybe a cynical representative of socialist philosophy or something. You know, whether or not that's well-reasoned is an entirely different question. One other example that I think nicely exemplifies how we could look at the notion of you is this this Kotex ad, this tampon advertisement. Uh, it's right below the lecture here. You can pause and then go down there to view it. As you view it, though, Listen specifically to what kind of audience are they appealing to? Who is it that you think is the you that they're, they're trying to ideally uh, get engaged in their advertisement? So go ahead and pause, look for that specifically, and then come back. So, I mean, obviously they're going for a kind of like in the know vibe, right? It's a kind of self-conscious advertisement where they say, we know how much advertisements suck. This is still an advertisement. So they're, they're probably going for maybe a more like media saturated generation. So probably people who are a little bit younger and someone who's, I think, you know, the, the lead actress of the commercial says like, I'm ambiguously aged between 18 and 24 or something. So we can already see they're constructing a kind of you that she says, you know, you can't tell what my race is and I'm fit and healthy. And there are all these different elements of identity that we are trying to present as our ideal self. And yet that's for all the other tampon commercials. This brand is just about anybody, right? Anyone who hates commercials, you're for us, right? So, we looked at the first persona, which was just the basic idea from yesterday's lecture of a rhetor's presentation of self. The second persona is the you that a rhetorical artifact creates or interpolates, if we want to use that word that I mentioned. Uh, think of La Meninas or uh, Uncle Sam or even the ideal audience for an advertisement or any other rhetorical artifact. Now we're moving towards the idea of the third persona. So... This comes from a rhetorician, Philip Wander, uh, and he asked the question, well, who is it that ex is excluded by a certain kind of argument or, or line of persuasion? If the second persona is, it a, is about a you, the third persona gets at the them or the it who we're distancing from, who we, who we don't speak about or who we're trying to scapegoat so the third persona is constituted by audiences not present audiences rejected or negated by a given rhetoric 
So really think of that idea of them. Uh, it's absolutely true that you can't always include everyone in a specific kind of audience. I mean, sometimes you can try and appeal to universal humanity, but more often than not, you're going to have to speak to a certain kind of community, like we'll see with our discussion of rhetorical situations. However, there's always some, some issue that can come in with the act of selection. Uh, how is it that we came to select who is a part of the us and who is not a part of the us, whether or not we explicitly negate them and say, like, these people are bad, or whether we just don't acknowledge them, there's still something worth looking at there. And again, this is, uh, for Wander, for Philip Wander, the rhetorician, another way of getting at a kind of ideological criticism, looking at flows of power in modern society that uh, people like Edwin Black and Wander thought that the neo-Aristotelian old-fashioned way of doing rhetorical criticism in the 20s and I think up to probably the 40s and 50s that it didn't really get at. Um, hegemony is another word that's closely tied to ideology. We're just bringing this up here because it has to do with a dominant, a dominant perspective of the world. So if an ideology comes to be held in a large part of society and it in very large uh, proportions keeps people in some sort of antagonistic form of oppressive situation. Uh, we would call that hegemonic. We would say that there's there's hegemony there. So it's it's a form of normalizing ideological behaviors where there's scapegoating or there's some sort of uh, you know refusal to acknowledge responsibility for an issue. Uh, so we've already talked about some of this at the top, but towards the bottom, this notion of the third persona becomes specifically relevant when we're talking about, you know, horrific acts of war or atrocity like the Vietnam War, the Holocaust, or uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb, right? Uh, and so people like Black and Wander are trying to use these perspectives or these this vocabulary to help keep rhetoric in check by giving rhetorical critics new ways to talk about them. So, if constitutive rhetoric is embodied in the idea of the second persona, a lot of what we talked about in, you know, scapegoating is is exemplified in the idea of the third persona. Second persona is the you that an artifact calls out to. The third persona is the them that it either doesn't speak about or it demonizes. Which is what I just said. I, I beat myself to my next slide. Right, this ties to the faces of the enemy example. The other idea, though, is that it could be uh, someone who's, you know, being silenced, who's a part of the, the us, but who, you know, is, is still being made a, a, a subtle them by saying, you're with us, but you're not fully with us. So, for example, uh, even though women have always been a part of, you know, American society, they haven't always had a voice. And uh, that would absolutely be, you could absolutely do any sorts of third persona examples surrounding uh, discourse before the suffrage movement or even during or after. The textbook has additionally a really nice critical example of something where you can actually see the language at play of we. And so this is a, an excerpt from a speech that Bill Clinton gave in 1998 uh, about his race issue race initiative. And what's so problematic here is that uh, the we that's talked about throughout isn't always the same. So, I mean, you know, we weren't always, uh, he's trying to make a sort of notion of national identity, but he's excluding some in certain inst instances and then over including some people as being responsible in other instances in, in his sort of personification of the nation. And the textbook does a really nice job of breaking that down. So I would absolutely, if you haven't read over this passage here and then see the way that, that they break that down line by line, uh, they, they go through each of the words in a really nice way that uh, we, we won't hear for, for brevity's sake, but definitely look at that if you're still trying to think about what the third persona would consider or would be considered in a kind of speech form. The other idea is that it can be someone who's not acknowledged, right? Which we already talked about. So you could see all these memes for the joke, uh, first world problems, right? I, it's not as common now, but a couple of years ago, it was said a little bit more as a kind of meme. And there's a video that 
tries to give voice to that, you know, unspoken perspective, it's undoubtedly still problematic and it's, you know, depiction of African cities as consistently run down or stuff, but it's a nonprofit organization who's trying to, you know, make an appeal to people through a, a meme pop culture reference. But that's that's a video down below. I think it's at the very bottom, so you can pause and go down to that. Just a, just an example, right? Those voices they're saying are normally a th a third persona that's that's not given a, the chance to speak. It's a them that that we don't acknowledge when we talk about something like first world problems, and that's why the joke makes sense because we say, well, we're so privileged to have these little minor issues. And the unspoken premise, right, the enthymeme clip that happens is there are plenty of people who are far less fortunate, who have much more significant issues. Lastly, and this is the last persona, if you're super tired of seeing this, uh, is actually one of my favorite ones. So uh, his name was Charles Morris, the rhetorical critic who came up with it. And he does a rhetorical analysis of J. Edver, uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, and his attempt to simultaneously, Morris argues, uh, wink to the homosexual community in his speech while nevertheless maintaining a kind of heterosexual public image. The definition that we'll get down, that, that's just the roots of the idea. You don't have to have that anywhere. But the definition that's relevant to us, the fourth persona is an audience who recognizes that the rhetor's first persona may not reveal all that is relevant about the speaker's identity, but maintain silence in order to enable the rhetor to perform that persona. So in other words, in some instances, you can't always speak, speak your mind, right? Sometimes you're restrained by your conditions, but there are ways that you can craft your message so that your the the other group that you want to speak to they get little what we'll call textual winks they get little ideas that oh oh maybe they are speaking to me as well and uh that group who's on the outside who feels like they get all these little clues that maybe they're still being validated in the main discourse the textbook calls that an eavesdropping audience what does this mean what does this look like well i'm going to include an example in the video here, I, I had trouble finding it on YouTube, but I had it downloaded, so I'll actually clip it into the video here. Hopefully, YouTube doesn't take this down before you can see it. Um, but it is a clip of the satirical uh, comedian, well, he, he formerly was in the satirical role of Stephen Colbert and his show. Uh, if you remember, he used to embody this kind of very grandiose imitation of the Fox News host Bill O'Reilly and was inc incredibly, you know, outspokenly Republican and, you know, pro-gun and all this other stuff. But he tried to do it in a kind of critical way, but without ever acknowledging that he was, you know, ironically performing this identity. But what we can do, and satire is a really great example of the fourth persona, because when you're engaging in satire, there's your basic level performance, but then there are all these other winks that let the audience know, oh, this is a joke, right? So there might be some people who identify with the character. And there, pl there are plenty of academic articles actually about audiences who think that Stephen Colbert really sincerely was just a staunch Republican. Uh, and they didn't fully understand why people were laughing all the time. Uh, but of course, other audiences knew that there was some sort of satirical stuff happening, that there were textual winks that let them know that a certain uh, additional layer of additional message was being used in the discourse. So we'll watch the video and then I'll talk through some of the specific clips, some of the specific moments in the video that let us know that there's there's a, another persona happening, that we we are being called to be an eavesdropping audience. The number one show that dominates cable news, The O'Reilly Factor. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Bill O'Reilly in the Culture War segment tonight, The Colbert Report on Comedy Central. It's a very successful program that owes everything to me. 
Each night, host Stephen Colbert tries to convince Americans that he is me. This show is not about me. <laughs> no, this program is dedicated to you, the heroes. And who are the heroes? The people who watch this show. <laughs> Average, hard-working Americans, you're not the elites. You're not the country club crowd. Now, who does that remind you of? With us now is Stephen Colbert. Bill, thank you for having me on. This is an amazing honor. I want you to know that I spend so much time in the world that is spinning all the time that to be in the no-spin zone actually gives me vertigo. Okay. Are you ready for the interview? I'm ready for anything. Okay, my life ready. is an open book. All I've right. been waiting my whole life for this, sir. Okay. I'm here at the heart of O'Reilly-dom right now. This is the Holy of Holies. Hit it. I'd love to be nailed. Colbert, that's a French name, is it not? It's a French name just to get the cultural elites on my side, mm -hmm. Bill. I'm okay. as Irish as you. I'm a Tormy, I'm an O'Neill, I'm a Tuck, I'm a Fee, I'm a Connolly. Because I, I could to, sit toe-to-toe -to -toe at a potato table with anybody. I talked to your third grade teacher, Miss Crabtree. Mm -hmm. She said back then you were little Steve Colbert in I South Carolina. Steve. I was Steve Colbert. But you, once you got here to Manhattan from mm -hmm. South Carolina, Change from little Steve Colbert to Stephen Colbert. Bill, you know you got to play the game that the media elites want you to do, okay? Some places you can draw the line, some places you can't. You and I have taken a lot of positions against the powers that be, and we've paid a heavy price. We have TV shows, product lines, and books, okay? It's That's tough. the price it's, we pay. It is tough being me. Is it tough being you? It's hard for me to be you. Is I'll it? tell you that much. It is. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you owe me an enormous amount of money? Well, if I were imitating you, I would, Bill, but there's a difference between imitation and emulation. Let me I tell see. you the difference, okay? Please. If you imitate someone, you owe them a royalty check. If you emulate them, you don't. There's a big difference. Check your lawyer. I will. I will. Now, what is it exactly that you do on your program? Well, what I do, Bill, is I catch the world in the headlights of my justice, okay? Your I justice. shine my light, right. okay? I shine my light no matter where that light takes me, okay? I'm not afraid of anything. I might be afraid of you, but other than that, I'm not afraid of a thing in the world, okay? Nothing. We on my show, and by we I mean me, yeah. usually. It's just you, uh, right? That's it. Okay. Turn the cameras on, I go, all right? Right. Nothing no scripted, writers, no... Nothing's no. prepared. I improvise the show every night just like you do, Bill. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in these prompters. No. You're making this stuff me. up as you go. It's all me. Now, who, who watches you? What's your audience? Do you do research? Do you know who... Well, Bill, that's one of the reasons I want to do my show. Okay. I emulate you. Yeah. And I want to bring your message of love and peace, which I understand that is your message. It is. I want to bring the message of love and peace to a younger audience, people in their 60s, people in their 50s, people who don't watch your show. Okay. So people in their 50s and 60s, too young for the factor, right. uh, are watching your show. Because we did a study of Jon Stewart's show. Yeah. That and, guy? Yeah, and it was stone slackers that were watching his show across Absolute, the board. Absolutely. You have to be high to understand John Stewart. Now, how, how that did, guy is, so, he is pinker than an Indian river grape. How does Stewart handle the fact that you are now more famous and successful than he is? I don't know. We don't talk. No? No, we don't talk at all. No. Does that drive him to smoke more substance that, that now that you have overtaken It might. He, yeah. It might. He was high most of the time I worked over there. I yeah. had to leave, Bill. Right. I didn't want to do my own show. I loved The Daily Show. I loved the people who worked there. And you... I had to get out from me. You emulating me were outraged by the conduct of Stewart and his minions, were you Absolutely. Because, you know, here's what I love about you, Bill, okay? You give... Okay? I am a giver. You give and give. Right. I do my show half hour. This is why I could never even hope to be you. I do my show half hour a night, four nights a week. I haven't seen my kids in 18 months, and I am losing calcium in my bones. Doctors mm -hmm. say I should stop. I'm not gonna. Okay? You go five nights a week, an hour an a night, hour. plus the radio factor, Bill. Right. What are you on? What gives you the strength? Jesus it, Christ it or is, Pat Robertson's protein I, shake? I, I'm, I'm, I'm motivated by the fact that you need material. That the more I'm on, the more successful you will be. Could I just get a feed See, from your show into my ear? I don't know. I, we have some kind of buzz thing. Now, look, I just want to tell the audience that mm -hmm. every left-wing critic in the country mm -hmm. loves you. There are no right-wing critics. But every left-wing critic I don't read them. love you. Why? Is it because you're French? Is that why? That must be it, Bill. Yeah. I'm using that to pull the wool over their eyes. So they, see, that's the sugar that you must puts be doing my medicine something. into the system. You must be doing something. I'm doing you, Bill. That the, you, they hate me. 
The New York Times hates me, but they love you. It's the New York Times. But what's Bill? the difference? You hate George me. Bush. Of course they're going to hate you. <laughs> they're haters, Bill. They are. They're scum. Um, I have a sheet here. It says you dislike and you are afraid of bears and owls. Is that true? I'm afraid of bears. I think owls are a waste of time. Okay. You don't think about owls. But no. They're in the John Stewart category. They absolutely are. Right. You yeah. won't have anything to do with owls. No. But you do fear bears. I do fear bears. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other They're thing giant is... giant marauding, godless killing machines. <laughs> There's one right there. Right there. Okay. That's not a real bear, right? No. Okay. Thank now you. That's, that's the editor of the New York Times. Okay. Now, your middle name is Tyrone. It is. How could that possibly happen? Because I'm Irish, Bill. Have no, you ever been? To, you ever French. been? You ever, have you ever been there to Tyrone? There is one Irish have you not ever Irish been named Colbert. To, have you ever been to Colbert? Con Colbert of the Easter Rebellion of 1916. Well, now you're Colbert again. I thought you had Who been are you? researchers. Are you Colbert or Colbert? Bill, I'm whoever you want me to be. All right, Colbert. I'm at the foot of the master. Yeah, I don't want you Make to be a French guy. Make me a spaniel guy. at thy gate, Bill. You want to be Irish? You can be Irish. I don't want you being a French guy. You know what, people? You know what I hate about people who criticize you? Who? They. They criticize what you say, but they never give you credit for how loud you say it. That's true. Mm -hmm. There are not many Or how people long you say it. As loud as I am. Mm -mm. I'm giving you the last word. Is that a wise thing to do? I, I give it to me. Yeah. What is the last word? I want to thank you for not asking me about that thing that we pre-agreed you wouldn't ask me about. Okay. <laughs> the kid, the thing that happened. Don't you say that? Yeah, that thing. <laughs> okay. I, that's the kind of guy I am. A sensitive, kind guy. And I'll be on your program tonight, right? Watch it. 4.30 in the morning, that's when you guys are on? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, that, okay. Yeah, that's Pacific time. All right. Looking forward to that. Stephen Colbert, right. everybody. Thank you, Bill. Owes his whole life to me, and I'm happy to give it up for him. So, first, obviously, is the, the sexual pun that he makes. He says, hit me, I'm ready to be nailed. Which, <laughs> it's unambiguously it's supposed to be a joke. Uh, he alludes to the fact, he says, the price we pay he and Bill O'Reilly, and then lists all these, you know, economic uh, benefits that they've gained from having a successful brand. So that's another ironic comment. Throughout, he's got all these examples of hyperbole. You could see, for instance, him trying to make a joke when he talks about call, pulling in the younger audience from Bill O'Reilly's show, who's, who's too young to watch his show, people who are 60 and 50. That, of course, is another ironic joke. Uh, but the interesting thing is you can even hear in the background of the the studio, you can hear Bill O'Reilly's producers identifying with the, the fourth persona, with that eavesdropping audience, because you can hear them laughing occasionally. So, for example, the timestamp here, uh, well, actually, that timestamp won't make sense to you because it's going to be embedded in my video. So ignore, ignore that. But when he's making the joke about the bear, his fear of bears, and then they put the bear picture on the screen... You can hear the producer in the background laughing. That's because they they pick up on the fact that Stephen Colbert is... Dude, there's a fourth persona. His first persona is this Republican guy. The fourth persona is he's, he's making critical commentary, or at least he's attempting to. And we're being asked to identify with this as, as, a, humorous, as a humorous performance. Okay, so those are all the concepts for today. Now we're going to move to talking about some of the important upcoming assignments. The first is going to be the artifact analysis essay. So this stuff is all on the syllabus already if you want to find it. Uh, you're aiming for 1,000 to 1,200 words. What you're going to do is you're going to choose an artifact that you think is rhetorically significant. Again, artifacts super broadly defined, you can absolutely do something more traditional like a speech or an advertisement, but you can also do something more creative like a film or you know a, a musical artifact. Just make sure that you feel you can comfortably and accurately use some of the concepts that we've been talking about because that's going to be a really important element. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is Pull from a couple of the concepts that we've talked through over the latter half of the course, and you can pull things from, you know, visual rhetoric, argumentation, narrative rhetoric, from today with our discussion of uh, audiences, or yesterday with our discussion of rhetors. You can pull any of that vocabulary to engage in your analysis. Uh, but what I'm going to ask you to do is clearly define the concepts that you're 
And I'll, I'll actually show you the rubric so that you can see this as I'm talking about this. So you can see up at the top, first, I want you to contextualize your artifact. Then I want you to use some concepts. I think I ask you to use at least three. Uh, define them using the textbook definition, or if they're from lecture, you can just you don't have to give an exact quote. If you do the textbook, though, make sure that you have an in-text citation. You don't need a work cited page, but still give quotes and then the page number. Define the concepts, apply them in your analysis, and then make sure you've got, you know, organization, a thesis statement, MLA format, uh, MLA citation, it just should just say MLA, and I'm pretty sure it does on the syllabus. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, I don't just want you to have a random collection of words. So, for example, you don't need to just say, if you're looking at, like, the, the famous picture of Martin Luther King being arrested, this artifact tells us about body rhetoric, the second persona, and a claim of value. I mean, yeah, that, that's going to make for an interesting analysis, but tell me to what end, right? Why are all these things added together? What kind of persuasive case does it make? That's what you're actually analyzing. And so you could say, instead, adding to the end, this artifact uses body rhetoric, the second persona, and a claim of value. Look down here. In order to move the audience to engage in the civil rights action. That would be then your argument in your analysis, and you would show how all these different theoretical things are happening in the artifact to move the audience towards being persuaded about something. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm, I'm asking you to not just use the concepts, but to show me towards what persuasive end are those concepts being utilized. That's what it means to be able to do rhetorical criticism, and so that's what I'm asking you to do here. Like you saw with the previous description of the assignment, it's not super, super long. In a full quarter, this would be like a 10 to 12 page paper usually, and there's more than one paper. So uh, we've, we've cut it down significantly. So hopefully it's a, a little more manageable. The rubric is also on the syllabus if you're looking for it. Uh, one thing that I want you to do for today's discussion post, I want you to come up with a possible artifact that you could use for your essay and three possible key terms or concepts that you could apply to the artifact. You only have to do like two-ish sentences for this. So I'm thinking about doing this artifact and then give like, you know, a little bit of context. This artifact, which is a blah, blah, blah. And I think I could use this, this, and this. As always, if you can link something so that peers can give feedback and they can get more context on what it is, that'd be really fantastic. I, I'm giving you also the a link to a PDF outline form that you can use. You don't have to use it. You won't be graded on it. I personally really appreciate being able to outline my thoughts. And so I just figured I would share it with you just in case you also like having any kind of, you know, textual form to, to put your thoughts. But if you do use it, don't worry about the latter questions that talk about like group feedback. That's from when I used to use it in the actual physical space of a classroom. So also, I think borders are hilarious. It's my version of a fourth persona as a teacher, a wink that I know <laughs> uh, handouts are silly, but nevertheless, I think they're helpful. So if you wonder, why is there a sixth grade border on this? It's Josh's fourth persona. Today's discussion post, uh, I already talked a little bit about it, or at least about the latter half, but uh, the first half is going to be, there are three different videos that are linked to on the discussion board. One is about, uh, it, it's a video made by the U.S. military justifying uh, the horrific internment camps that were used to put, uh, to, to house Asian Americans during uh, wartime. Uh, and so that's the first video. The second video is a Kia advertisement. And the third video is a clip from a Comedy Central show. One of them, I'm just getting at an idea of a you. Who's the ideal you? The, the second persona. Another has a specific them that's being demonized or that's being ostracized from the us of a community. The third persona. And one of the videos exemplifies a kind of textual wink a fourth persona where there's there are two different levels where there's an eavesdropping audience can see that can see specifically this one is uh 
Well, actually, no, I'm not going to give you that hint. You should be able to pick up on it. But one of them has textual winks that lets you know that there's another layer of meaning at play. Think the Stephen Colbert piece that we watched. There's one of each, so uh, there shouldn't be overlap on those. One is second, one is third, one one is fourth. Uh, you'll want a, an overall post of about two to three paragraphs for that. They don't have to be super elaborate. Uh, just, you know, show me that you understand the concept and have a little bit of elaboration on that. Uh, lastly, in a sentence or two, just tell us that artifact that you think you might use. You can absolutely change it after you've posted. That's fine. I just want to be able to go through and look at and see what some people are thinking of using so I can reach out if I think it's, you know, off the wall. Um, so what is the artifact you might use? And then what are some concepts you could use to analyze it? My hope is that, and actually I'm going to ask in your peer feedback, mostly focus on giving feedback to the artifact and the concepts. So as you're reading through peers posts, you can say, oh, I know this artifact. Have you thought about using body rhetoric to talk about this? Or have you thought about talking about how this is an image event or, you know, help remind them of different concepts that they could use from the course? That's the aim. Normally we would do that in a kind of group peer feedback structure. This might not be as useful. I'm hoping it will give a little bit of assistance because I think peer feedback is really important, but that's all we can do in the online format given the circumstances. Over the weekend, uh, read chapter eight of Rhetoric and Civic Life. And I'd like you to come prepared with two pages written of your essay. For Monday's discussion board, you're going to post your draft and then you're going to get peer feedback of, uh, of a couple sentences. That'll be most of the discussion board Monday so that you can revise anything you want to on Tuesday and then be ready for the final essay submission on Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So that's going to be due right, excuse me, right before we take the final on Thursday. Uh, remember, like I said, that it's due on Wednesday. That's super important. And then last but not least, and this has all been super long-winded, so thanks for sticking through this. Uh, the first 20 minutes of my office hours on Monday are going to be that extra credit discussion session I talked about. My hope is that it'll be a chance for you to see some of the faces of people who've been a part of the discussion boards. We can maybe, if you have like questions about something we brushed over really quickly or comments on a possible additional example that we could tie in or really anything else that you think would make for a fruitful 20-ish minute discussion, uh, please come on in. I, I think it would be cool. Just keep in mind that for that one, unlike normal office hours, I'll let in multiple people at a time and I'll just ask you to you know say hello, introduce yourself. It might end up being closer to 30 or 40 minutes depending on how many people show up, but uh, come in, share, and then if you pop in, I'll you know, note that you came and uh, you'll get a, a just a point of extra credit. I said on the syllabus, there's no extra credit. I'm a softy and I want to have a fun chat about all this neat stuff. So uh, if you're interested, please come in. Hopefully it'll be interesting. Maybe it'll be a train wreck. Who knows? Shoulder shrug. Uh, that is everything. Thank you for a wonderful week so far. I'm super excited to see some of the artifacts that you're interested in writing about. And other than that, uh, best of luck with your post. And don't forget that tonight at 11.59 p.m., that extended response number two from yesterday is due. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Have a wonderful day and weekend. Take care.